All right, as we start part two, remember part one is really focused on Louis' childhood and then him finding the track and his love for running and heading to the Olympics. But part two is really the shift where World War II is started and Louis drafted. And so we start um, chapter six. It's called The Flying Coffin. And we see over here, we're talking about the B-24. So this is a plane that's known as the Flying Coffin. Um, and it is going to be a really important piece of foreshadowing for the rest of the book. And I will warn you, chapter six is kind of long. So grab a snack or something to drink from the here we go with chapter six. Oh, and we're on page, let's see, 55. Please follow along as I read. As Japanese planes dove over Oahu, more than 2,000 miles to the west, a few Marines were sitting in a mess tent on Wake Atoll having breakfast. Um, and Atoll is a word that you'll see over and over again. It's just like a bunch of coral that make a little island. Extremely small, lacking its own water supply, Wake would have been a useless atoll for her one enormous attribute. It lay far out in the Pacific, making it a strategically ideal spot for an airbase. And so it was home to one runway and about 500 bored American servicemen, mostly Marines. Aside from the occasional refueling stopovers of Pan American World Airways planes, nothing interesting ever happened here. But that December morning, just as the Marines were starting on their pancakes, an air raid silent siren began waving. By noon, the sky was streaked with Japanese bombers, buildings were exploding, and a few startled men on less than three square miles of coral found themselves on the front in the Second World War. You hopefully remember that at the very end of Chapter 5, that's when Pearl Harbor was attacked. And so that's what this is referencing. It was on December 7th, and so it was on that December morning. That's what they're referencing here. All over the Pacific that morning, the story was the same. In less than two hours over Pearl Harbor, Japan badly wounded the American Navy and killed more than 2,400 people. Almost simultaneously, at the same time, it attacked Thailand, Shanghai, Malaya, the Philippines, Guam, Midway, and Wait. And remember, these are territories that the U.S. is in control of right now. So, the, like, the Philippines is not in America or close to America. It is a U.S. territory at the moment. In one day of breathtaking violence, a new Japanese onslaught had begun. In America, invasion was expected at any moment. Less than an hour after the Japanese bombed Hawaii, mines were being laid in San Francisco Bay. In Washington, Civil Defense Minister Fiorello LaGuardia, which is up in D.C., looped around the city in a police car, sirens blaring, shouting the words, Calm! into a loudspeaker. At the White House, Eleanor Roosevelt, who, as an aside, is one of my top favorite humans, dashed up a letter to her daughter, Anna, urging her to get her children off the West Coast. A butler overheard the president speculating on what he'd do with Japanese forces if they went as far as Chicago. So the U.S. is expecting Japanese forces not just to bomb Hawaii, but to actually invade the West Coast starting in California. Meanwhile, just up Massachusetts Avenue, smoke billowed from the grounds of the Japanese embassy where Jimmy Sasaki worked. Remember, this is uh, Louis' friend from USC. Staffers were burning documents in the embassy's yard. On the sidewalk, the crowd watched in silence. On the night of December 7th and 8th, there were four air raid alerts in San Francisco. At Shepherd Field Airport School in Texas, booth officers ran through the barracks at 4 a.m. screaming that Japanese planes were coming and ordering the cadets to sprint outside and throw themselves on the ground. In coming days, trenches were dug along the California coast, and schools in Oakland were closed. From New Jersey to Alaska, reservoirs, bridges, tunnels, factories, and waterfronts were put under guard. In Kearney, Nebraska, citizens were instructed on disabling incendiary bombs with garbage hoses. Blackout curtains were hung in windows across America, from solitary farmhouses to the White House. Blackout curtains um, would cover your window so that if a plane was bombing at night, they wouldn't be attracted to the light coming from the house. Shocking rumors circulated. Kansas City was about to be attacked. San Francisco was being bombed. The Japanese had captured the Panama Canal. <coughs> so all of this is showing us that Americans are scared. They're scared that Japan's going to attack and invade the rest of the country. None of this happened, but this is what people were fearing. 
Japan galloped over the globe. On December 10th, it invaded the Philippines and seized Guam. The next day, it invaded Burma. A few days later, British Borneo, Hong Kong fell on Christmas, North Borneo, Rabul, Rabal, Manila, and the U.S. base in the Philippines fell in January. The British were driven from Malaya and into surrender in Singapore in 70 days. That's fast. There was one snap. Wait. Surely expected to be an easy conquest wouldn't give in. For three days, the Japanese bombed and strafed the other. On December 11th, a vast force, including 11 destroyers and light cruisers, launched an invasion attempt. The little group of defenders shoved them back, sinking two destroyers and damaging nine other ships, shooting down two bombers and forcing the Japanese to abort or leave their missions, their first loss of the war. It wasn't until December 23rd that the Japanese finally seized Wake and captured the men on it. To the Americans, 52 military deaths, an estimated 1,153 Japanese had been killed. So pause for one second. I thought it might be helpful for you to see a little visual here. So this little tiny town in the Pacific is Wake Island. Um, you'll see that this is Japan and this is the United States. And it right here is Hawaii. So they're talking about fighting for Wake Island and wanting to conquer this island, <laughs> similar to Hawaii, these are really important because it's the little bits of land that are between Japan and the west coast of the U.S. So that's why this little tiny island is not such a big deal. Continuing. For several days, the captives were held on the airfield, shivering by night, sweltering by day, singing Christmas carols to cheer themselves. They were initially slated for execution. But after Japanese officers' intervention, most were crowded into the holds of ships and sent to Japan and occupied China as some of the first Americans to become POWs under the Japanese. Unbeknownst to America, 98 captives were kept on wake. The Japanese were going to enslave them. But this is not allowed. This is a war crime to enslave your captives. But that's what was going on. Though Louis had been miserable over having to rejoin the Air Corps, it wasn't so bad after all. Training at Texas's Ellington Field, then Midland Army Flying School, he had earned superb test scores. The flying was usually straight and level, so air sickness wasn't a problem. Best of all, women found the flyboy uniform irresistible. While Louis was out walking one afternoon, a convertible fringed in blondes pulled up, and he was scooped into the car and sped off to a party. When it happened a second time, he sensed a positive trend. Louis was trained in the use of two bomb sites. At that time, the military was experimenting with dive bombing tactics for heavy bombers. For dive bombing training, he had one dollar handheld sight. He had a one dollar handheld sight consisting of an aluminum plate with a peg and a dangling weight. Okay, so he's he has a little um like a scope, like a binocular thing that's going to help him focus uh, where he's going to drop. For flat runs, he had the Northern Bomb Site, an extremely sophisticated analog computer that, at $8,000, cost more than twice the price of the average American home. On a bombing run with the Northern Site, Louis could visually locate the target, make calculations, and feed information on airspeed, altitude, wind, and other factors into the device. The bomb site would then take over flying the plane, follow a precise path to the target, calculate the drop angle, and release the bombs at the optimal moment. Once the bombs were gone, Louis would yell, bombs away, and the pilot would take control again. Norton bomb sites were so secret that they were stored in guarded vaults and moved under armed escort, and the men were forbidden to photograph or write about them. If his plane was going down, Louis was under orders to fire his Colt 45 into the bomb site to prevent it from falling into enemy hands, then be about saving himself. So, we're just showing that there's a big range here of technology that they can use after dropping bombs, and that the U.S. does have this ability to like track where their bombs go, and it's actually useful, but they don't want anyone else to know about it. In August 1942, Louis graduated from Midland, was commissioned a second lieutenant. He jumped into a friend's Cadillac and drove to California to say goodbye to his family before heading into his final round of training with Ben Moore. 
He, now a Navy Chief Petty Officer stationed in San Diego, came home to see Louis off. And here you can see the bomb site that we were just talking about. That's, uh, it says a bombardier working his bomb site. This is not Louis, but it's what they would have been using. On the afternoon of August 19th, the Zamperinis gathered on the front steps for a last photograph. Louis and Pete, dashing in their dress uniforms, stood on the bottom step with their mother between them, tiny beside her son. Louise was on the verge of tears. The August sun was sharp on her face, and she and Louis squinted hard and looked slightly away from the camera, as if all before them was lost in the glare. Louis and his father rode together to the train station. The platform was crowded with uniformed young men and crying parents, clinging to one another, saying goodbye. When Louis embraced his father, he could feel him shaking. As the train pulled away, Louis looked out the window. His father stood with his hand in the air, a wavering smile on his face. Louis wondered if he'd ever see him again. Right, Louis is pretty carefree, but you also can't ignore that he's going off to war. And so he's being aware that this could be his last time he's with his family. Um, and it tells you right here that this is a last family photograph as Louis leaves to go to war. Um, and we've got Sylvia, Louis' sister, and her husband. And then in the front, we've got Pete, Louise, and Louis. The train carried him to a perpetual dust storm known as Ephrata, Washington, hey, hey, where there was an air base in the middle of a dry lake bed. The lake bed was on a mission to bury the base, the men and all of their planes, and it was succeeding. It was just so dusty, it's covering them all in dust. The air was so clouded with blowing dirt, the men waded through drifts a foot and a half deep. Clothes left out of the duffel bags were instantly filthy. And all of the meals, which crews ate outside while sitting on the ground, were infused with sand. The ground crews, which had to replace 24 dirt clogged aircraft engines in 21 days, resorted to spraying oil in the taxiways to keep the dust down. Getting the lake bed off the men was problematic. The hot water ran out long before the men did, and because the PX didn't sell shaving soap, practically everyone had a brambly, dust catching beard. Not long after his arrival, Louis was standing at the base, sweating and despairing over the landscape, when a square second lieutenant walked up and introduced himself. He was Russell Allen Phillips, and he would be Louis's pilot. Born in Greencastle, Indiana, in 1916, Phillips had just turned 26. He had grown up in a profoundly religious home in La Corte, Indiana, where his father had been a Methodist pastor. As a boy, he'd been so quiet that adults must have thought him timid or shy, but he had a secret bold streak. He snuck around his neighborhood with bags full of flour, launching gorilla attacks on windshields of passing cars. This is not like the animal gorilla, but this is like a sneak war attack. And one Memorial Day weekend, he wedged himself into a car trunk to sneak into the infield of the Indy 500. That's like the NASCAR race. He had gone to Purdue University, where he'd earned a degree in forestry and conservation. In ROTC, his captain had called him the most unfit, lousy looking soldier he'd ever seen. Ignoring the captain's assessment, Phillips had enlisted in the Air Corps, where he proved to be a born airman. At home, they called him Alan. In the Air Corps, they called him Phillips. Now, Phil is going to stick around our story for a while. Keep in mind the similarities him and Louis have. They're always getting into trouble and pranking people. Um, and so, this is something that we want to know for our story. The first thing people tended to notice about Philip was that they hadn't noticed him earlier. He was so receptive that he could be in a room for a long time before anyone realized he was there. He was smallish, short-legged. Some of the men called him Sandblaster because, said one pilot, his fans were so close to the ground. For unknown reasons, he wore one pant leg markedly shorter than the others. He had a tidy, pleasant, boyish, boyish face that tended to blend with the scenery. This probably contributed to his invisibility, switch that up a bit, but what really did it was his silence. Phillips was an amiable man and was judging by his letters highly articulate because he was really well spoken, he had a good vocabulary, but he preferred not to speak. You could park him in a crowd of chattering party goers and he'd emerge at evening's end having never said a word. People had long conversations with him only to realize later that he hadn't spoken. If he had a boiling point, he never reached it. He 
He rolled along with every inexplicable order from his superiors, every foolish act of his inferiors, and every abrasive personality or hard-to-be-around personality that military life could throw at an officer. He dealt with every manner of adversity with calm, adaptive acceptance. In a crisis, Louis would learn Philip's veins ran ice water, meaning he's really cool and calm when there's a crisis happening. Now, over here, there's a picture of Russell Allen Phillips. So his family calls him Allen. That's his middle name. His last name is, is Phillips, but we're going to know him by Phil for a lot of the book. Phillips had one consuming passion. When he had entered college, his father had taken a new pastorship in Terry Hall. There, Phillips' sister had introduced him to a girl from the choir, a college student named Cecil Perry, known as Cece. She had auburn hair, a curvy figure, a buoyant disposition, a quick mind, and a family cat named Tyler. She was studying to be a teacher. At prom in Terre Haute, Alan kissed Cece. He was a goner, and so was she. On Saturday night, November 1941, when he left for the Air Force, Philip spent five last minutes with Cece at the Indianapolis train station. When the fighting was over, he promised he'd make her his bride. He kept her photo on his footlocker and wrote her love letters several times a week. When she turned 21, he sent her his pay and asked her to find an engagement ring. Alan's ring was soon on Cece's finger. In June 1942, just after her graduation, Cece traveled to Phoenix to see Alan get his wings. Crazy in love, the two talked about running off to be hitched right then, but reconsidered, deciding to marry at his next training venue and live together there until he was deployed. That venue was afraid of, and when Philip saw it, he kicked himself. I wish 100 times that we had gotten married when we were at Phoenix, he wrote to her, but I wouldn't ask you now to come out here and live in a dump like a freighter. Again, they postponed their wedding. In the fall, Alan's training would be finished, and they hoped they'd have one more chance to see each other before he went to war. In a freighter, Louis and Phillips fell in together. Phillips floated along contentedly in Louis's chatty bonhomie, just Louis's really friendly. Louis liked Phillips's quiet steadiness and thought him the kindest person he'd ever met. They never had a single argument and were almost never apart. Phillips called Louis Zamp. Louis called Phillips Phil. So they just kind of become best buddies. They're pretty opposite when it comes to how they talk and interact with people, but they're very similar in how they kind of like to get up to mischief and they're both pretty calm when bad things happen. All of those qualities are going to be important moving forward. The rest of Phil's bomber crew assembled. Serving as engineer and top turret gunner would be 22-year-old Stanley Pillsbury, who had been running his family's main farm before joining up. The other engineer was Virginia native Clarence Douglas, who would operate one of the two side-directed waste guns behind the wings. The navigator and nose gunner would be Robert Mitchell, a professor's son from Illinois. Tiny Frank Glassman, with his tightly curled hair, was a dead ringer, carpo left, meaning he looks like him. He would be their radio man and leader of their battle gunner. Because Frank hailed from Chicago, the men called him Gangster. Ray Lambert of Maryland would, would man the tail gun. The crew girl's magnet was Harry Brooks, a good looking, ebullient, or like enthusiastic radio man and waste gunner from Michigan. The co pilot would be George Mosnet Jr., because co pilots were rotated from plane to plane as they qualified to be pilots. Mosnet wouldn't stay with the crew, but he became fast friends with Phil and Louie. And up here you can see a picture of the crew. Mosnet, Mitchell, Phil, and Louie were officers. The others were enlisted. All were bachelors, but Harry Brooks, like Phil, had a steady girl back home. Her name was Sinette, and before the war, she and Harry had set their wedding date for May 8, 1943. The men were issued heavy sheepskin, the real sheepskin jackets and wool clothing, assembled and photographed. They would make up crew number eight in the nine crew 372nd Bomb Squadron of the 307th Bomb Group, 7th Air Force. All they needed was a plane. Lou was hoping to be assigned to a B-17 Flying Fortress. It was the kind of plane that men wanted to be seen in. Handsome, masculine, nimble, fiercely armed, reliable, long-winded, and practically indestructible. The plane that no one wanted was a new bomber, Consolidated Aircraft B-24 Liberator. On paper, it was generally comparable to the B-17, but for one major advantage. Thanks to auxiliary fuel tanks and slender, ultra-efficient Davis wings, it could fly literally all day. 
a decisive asset in the sprawling World War II theaters, meaning because World War II takes over so much space globally, it's a big deal that this plane has extra space for gas and it can fly for longer. Flat face, rectangular, and brooding, the B-24 had looked only a myopic mother could love, meaning only a mother with poor eyesight would love this kid because it's so ugly. That's basically what they're saying about the B-24. It's an ugly plane. Crewman gave it a host of nicknames, among them the Flying Brick, the Flying Buckstar, and the Constipated Lumberer, a play on Consolidated Liberator. The cockpit was oppressively cramped, forcing pilot and co-pilot to live cheek by jowl for missions as long as 16 hours. This would be like cheek by jowl, meaning it's like really, really close together. Um, and as you can see right here, this is still at the cockpit of this plane. Craning over the mountainous control panel, the pilot had a panoramic view, meaning all around view, of his plane's snout and not much else. Navigating the nine inch wide Bombay catwalk, catwalk could be difficult, especially in turbulence. One slip and you tumble into the bay, which was fitted with fragile aluminum doors that would tear away with the weight of a falling man. Taxiing was an adventure. The B 24's wheels had no steering, so the pilot had Joel the bomber along by feeding power to one side, engines than the other, and working back and forth to the left and right brakes, one of which was usually more sensitive than the other. So when you're taxiing, it's like when you're basically driving along the runway, the pilot can't steer, so they just have to alternate which side of the plane they give power to to try and get down the runway in the right direction. This made the taxiways a pageant of lurching planes, all of which sooner or later ended up veering into places where the pilots intended them to go, and from which they often had to be extricated if successful. Pilot Byron Kinney once wrote that the first time he got into a B-24 cockpit, it was like sitting on the front porch and buying the house. The sentiment was common. The Liberator was one of the heaviest planes in the world. The D model then in production weighed 71,200 pounds loaded. Flying it was like wrestling a bear, leaving pilots weary and sore. Because pilots usually man the yoke with their left hand while their right hands work the other controls, B-24 pilots were instantly recognizable when shirtless because the muscles on their left arms dwarfed those on their right arms. So because the plane is so hard to steer on only one side, they always have one arm whose muscles are a lot bigger than the other arm. The plane was so clumsy that it was difficult to fly in the tight formations that were critical to fending off attack. A squiggle of turbulence or a crewman walking inside the fuselage would tip the plane off its axis. The B-24 was plagued with mechanical difficulties. If one of the four engines quit, staying airborne was challenging. The failure of two engines was often an emergency. Shortly after the plane was introduced, there were several incidents in which the B-24 tail dropped off midair. And though the war was young, the plane was winning a reputation for being delicate, like easily breakable, especially in the skinny wings, which would snap off if stuck in combat. Some of the men at Afreda thought of the B-24 as a death trap. After a long wait, the 372nd Squadron planes flew into Afreda. Bill's crew walked out and squinted at the horizon. Even from a distance, there was no mistaking the silhouettes or the outlines. As the men grumbled, Louie heard one voice pipe up. It's the flying coffin. You know, if they're going to describe a B-24 for this long in a book, this is not on accident. This is foreshadowing, right? So... First of all, Louie's going to be stuck in a B-24, and second of all, it's pretty safe to assume it's going to have problems. They were assigned to a B-24D that looked like all the others. For the next three months, in Afrida in August and September, and Sioux City in October, they practically lived in it. They flew in formation, fired at targets pulled by two planes, simulated combat runs, and dive bombs. One day, they buzzed so low over Iowa that the propeller picked up a storm of sand scanning the paint off the plane's belly, and scourging the legs of Pillsbury, who was sitting by an open hatch in the tail, trying to photograph their dummy bones as they fell into target net. Throughout it all, Louis perched in the glass-windowed greenhouse in the plane's nose, bombing targets. So Louis's job is to ride in the plane and drop the bombs and hit things. The CO soon learned of the squadron's prowess. Angry farmers came calling after the 372nd's 100-pound bombs, flattened an outhouse, and one unfortunate cow 
so they're not really bonding things, but they accidentally smash the cow. Phil's crew had their first scare at Ifrida. On a training flight, they had radio trouble and got lost. Flew around in blind confusion for hours. And ended up landing at nearly midnight in Spokane, half a state away from their slated destination. They had been missing for three and a half hours, and the entire West Coast Air Corps had been hunting for them. When Phil stepped off the plane, he got one chewing out from a colonel. When he flew back to Euphreda, he got another in stereo from a colonel and a major. I grew a little older that night. Sweet, believe me, he wrote to Cece, because he's getting trouble. The panic had been justified, for accidents were common and deadly. Before Louis had begun his bombardier training, he had received a letter from a friend who was an Air Corps cadet. I guess you read about the cadet and instructor who was killed here last week. The poor devils never had a chance. They stalled their ship while turning from the base leg onto landing approach. The ship made a one-trim spin and then really hit the ground. When they hit, it tore their bodies to pieces. The safety belt cut the instructor half in two. All over the wrecked part of the airplane, it looked like somebody took it and threw about three pans of tomatoes and crackers all over it, blood and flesh. They were mangled to bits, couldn't even identify them looking at them. So this is to tell us, right, that if a B-24 goes down, it's serious, and the likelihood of survival is very low because this is how gory it can be. It was the kind of story that was filling the letters of would-be airmen all over the country. Pilot and navigator error, mechanical failure, and bad luck were killing trainees at a stunning rate. In the Army Air Forces, or the AAF, there were 52,651 stateside aircraft accidents over the course of the war, killing 14,903 personnel, meaning there's this many accidents just in the U.S. during training and leading to these deaths. Though some of these personnel were probably on coastal patrol and other duties, it can be presumed that the vast majority were trained, killed without ever seeing a combat theater. In the three months in which Phil's men trained as a crew, 3,041 AAF planes, more than 33 per day, met with accidents stateside, killing nine men per day. In subsequent or following months, death tallies exceeding 500 were common. In August 1943, 590 airmen would die stateside, 19 per day. Louis, Phil, and their crew saw the dying firsthand. In July, Phil's close friend had been killed in a B-24 just after Phil had dinner with him. On another day, Phil's crew spent part of a rainy morning sitting in a briefing room with another crew as they awaited flights. Both crews went to their planes, but at the last minute, Phil's crew was ordered back. The other crew took off, flew two miles, and then crashed, killing the pilot and the navigator. In October in Sioux City, another bomber from their group plowed into a field, killing two. When he learned that the press was reporting on the crash without giving the crewman's name, Phil ran out of a meeting to get word to his family that he hadn't been on the plane. So these airmen are crashing all the time because these planes are new and they can fly farther, but they're really not safe and they're really not reliable. The Air Corps did its best to teach men how to survive a crash. Men were drilled in preparing their planes for impact and equipping themselves for post-crash survival. Each man was assigned to a crash station, which in Louis's case was by the waste window behind the right wing. They were also schooled in bailout simulations, jumping from parked planes. Some rolled off the catwalk and dropped through the open bomb bay doors. Others leapt from waste windows, wondering how, if jumping from an airborne plane, they'd avoid being cut in two by the twin rudders just behind the windows. They were also taught how to ditch or make a controlled landing on water. Phil studied dutifully, but he found the idea of landing a giant bomber on water kind of silly. The training films Shirley deepened his doubts. In every film, the ditching B-24 broke apart. So even as they're watching training films on how to survive this, the plane falls apart every time. So Phil's not really feeling like this is survivable. Training was a crucible, and it transformed Phil's crew. Crucible is a cross. They would not, excuse me, they would not all live through what lay ahead, but the survivors would speak of their good fortune in serving among such skilled men. They worked together with seamless efficiency, judging by their training scores in the grim business of bombs and bullets. There was no better crew in the squadron. Among surviving crewmen and men from other crews, the warmest praise would be reserved for Phil. 
B-24s were built for tall pilots, and though Phil needed a cushion to get his feet to the pedals and his eyes over the control panel, remember he's short. By all accounts, he was superb at his job. Phil, Louis told a reporter, was a damn swell pilot. So we know a few things here. We know the B-24s are really, rel- are really unreliable and crash a lot. We know that even while they're training for crashes, Phil is feeling like training for a water crash and crashes in general is pointless because you're going to die if you crash. And we know that Phil is a great pilot. Now, this chapter, although it's long and just about B-24s, it's really setting us up for the future. So this information is important to us understanding the rest of the story. The B-24 assigned to Phil's crew had its own personality. It had a valve that oozed fuel into the bomb bay, prompting Pillsbury to develop a nervous habit of pacing the fuselage, sniffing the air. It had curmudgeonly fuel transfer valve. Curmudgeonly is usually how you describe like a cranky old person. That Pillsbury and Douglas had to finesse into place, left it stick wide open, blow an engine or trigger a deafening backfire. The fuel gauges were reliable only until the tanks neared empty, at which point they sometimes reported that the plane was magically gaining fuel. One engine, for reasons known only to the plane, was thirstier than the others, so the gauges had to be watched constantly. In time, the men's misgivings about the Liberator fell away. In hundreds of hours of intense training, their plane never failed them. For all its ugliness and quirks, it was a noble thing, rugged and inexhaustible. The ground crewmen felt the same, nursing Phil's plane with affection and fretting while it flew. When it returned, they received it with relief, scolding the crew for any stretches. Airmen talked of flying boxcars, but Phil and Louis dismissed them. Louis described it as our home. On the ground, the crew drank together, swam in the local lake, and cruised around a freight out of Sioux City. In the latter, Louis discovered that the enlisted ground crewmen who had preceded them in town had convinced the local women that their insignia indicated that they were officers. As Louis set off to right this wrong, Phil pulled night duty at the operations office. Sometime one night, he drifted into a troubled dream. In it, he came home from the war, only to find that Cece had given him up, broken up with him. On a Sunday afternoon in mid-October of 1942, the men of the 372nd were told to pack their bags. Their training was being cut short, and they were to be sent to California's Hamilton Field and rushed overseas. Phil was crestfallen. Cece was about to come see him. He would miss her by three days. On October 20th, the squadron flew out of Iowa. At Hamilton Field, an artist was working his way down the plane, painting each one's name and accompanying illustration. Naming bombers was a grand tradition. Many B-24 crews dreamed up delightfully clever names, among them E. Pluribus Aluminum, the E Pluribus Unum is on uh, money, Axis Grinder, The Bad Penny, and Bombs Nip On. Quite a few of the rest were shamelessly body, meaning they're like inappropriate sexual, painted with scantily clad and unclad women. One featured a sailor chasing a naked girl around the fuselage. Its name was Willie Maker. Louis had a snapshot taken of himself grinning under one of the more ribald examples or scandalous examples. Phil's plane needed a name, and no one could think of one. After the war, the survivors would have different memories of who named the plane, but a letter penned that fall, Phil would write that it was co-pilot George Mazinek who suggested Superman. Everyone liked it, and the name was painted on the plane's nose, along with the superhero himself, a bomb in one hand and a machine gun in the other. So here we can see uh, Phil's right here, and then here's Superman, and he's got a bomb. Lou didn't think much of the painting. In photographs, the gun looks like a shovel, but Phil loved it. Most crews referred to their planes as she. Phil insisted that his plane was all man. The men were slated for combat, but they hadn't been told where they would serve. Judging by the heavy winter gear, Louis thought that they were bound for Alaska's Aleutian Islands, which had been invaded by the Japanese months before. He was happily wrong. They were going to Hawaii. On the evening of October 24th, Louis called home for a last goodbye. He just missed Pete, who came for a visit only a few minutes after his brother hung up. Sometime after speaking to Louis, Louise pulled out a set of note cards on which she kept lists of Christmas card recipients. After Louis' last visit home, she'd taken out one of the cards and on it, 
jotted down the date and a few words about Louis' departure. This day, she noted Louis' phone call. These were the first two entries in what would become Louise's war diary. Before he left Hamilton Field, Louis dropped a little package in the mail addressed to his mother. When Louise opened it, she found inside a pair of airman's wings. Every morning, through all that lay ahead for her, Louise would pin the wings to her dress. Every night before she went to bed, she'd take them off her dress and pin them to her nightgown. This is really important because we know that Louise gets really stressed over how Louis is doing and his well-being. And this is kind of an outward symbol for us of how much she is just trying to be connected to her son. She wears those air rings to help her remember Louis and show other people that's what she's thinking about. On November 2nd, 1942, Phil's crew climbed aboard Superman and ready to go to war. They were heading into a desperate fight. North to south, Japan's new empire. 5,000 miles from the snowbound Aleutians to Java, hundreds of miles south of the equator. West to east, the empire sprawled over more than 6,000 miles from the border of India to the Gilbert and Marshall Islands in the Central Pacific. In the Pacific, virtually everything above Australia and west of the International Dateline had been taken over by Japan. So basically, everything on that side of the globe, Japan has conquered, and they're knowing going into the fight that this is not looking good. Only a few Eastwood Islands had been spared. Among them, the Hawaiian Islands, Midway, Canton, Punafuti, and a tiny paradise called Palmyra. It was from these outposts that the men of the AAF were trying to win the Pacific, as the saying went, one damned island after another. So they're just going to take over island after island after island until they kind of take it back to the Pacific. That day, Superman banked over the Pacific for the first time. The crew was down for a walk with Hickam Field where the war had begun for America 11 months before, and where it would soon begin for them. The rim of California slid away, and then there was nothing but open. From this day forward, until victory or defeat, transfer, discard, capture, or death took them from it, the vast Pacific would be beneath and around them. Its bottom was already littered with downed warplanes and the ghosts of lost airmen. Every day of this long and ferocious war, more would join them. Again, Heavy, heavy foreshadowing in this chapter. We know B-24s are full of problems. We know that lost airmen are lining the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. We know Japan is conquering the Pacific. It's not looking good for the U.S. We know planes don't do well when they crash in the water. Uh, we know Phil's a great pilot. Really important chapter. Uh, moving on to the rest of the book. It was a long one. Thanks for sticking with it. And we will do chapter seven next.